Hi, Pablo and Michael. I'm so glad to have you both here. I'm rendering unconscious. Very happy to be here. So where shall we begin? Let's begin with the topic of, uh, of heterodox psychoanalysis, mm. which in itself is... Uh, is a quite acute question, I think, and now that uh, the field of psychoanalysis has uh, uh, split several times, let's say, and, and become an international phenomenon, and it takes different shapes and form in different different countries. We have conflicts everywhere. We have people uh, doing like a really orthodox Lacanianism, Kleinianism, Freudianism, mm -hmm. etc. People also try to sit themselves in the, in the middle, try to do something creative with, with different kinds of psychoanalysts. And then this is certainly it's an it's an important uh, topic, uh, not only for for psychoanalytic as, as a field, uh, psychoanalytic theory, uh, but obviously since psychoanalysis is principally a, a practice, the practice in psychoanalyst, uh, what this uh, implies on the level of the clinic, but even more, and this I perhaps find the most interesting question of all, but it's because. From my experience, psychoanalysts tend to be subjects, <laughs> and the question of uh, what what heterodox, you know, uh, psychoanalysis in in the sense that to the to the extent that it implies some kind of confusion, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but this implies or signifies on the level of the subject of the analyst. Thankfully, psychoanalysts are subjects. <laughs> Thankfully, yeah. it, also... it strikes me it's like a. Oh, please go ahead. Vanessa. No, I was Sorry. just going to say, but also end up in group dynamics, just like all other mm -hmm. humans, all other subjects. <laughs> yeah. It's it's a really Lacanian question to me. It's one of social bond rather than uh, institutional bond or financial bond or a bond of loyalty. Who do you want to work with? Where do you want to work with them? Which is, is weirdly how Pablo and I met. Well, I uh, emailed him because I was like, this guy's book looks interesting. Okay, he's not a member of the group I was a member of. I don't know him. He's nice enough to answer my email, and we're working together, figuring some things out together uh, in a very non heterodox way that I appreciate. Yeah. So, um, I love that. That's what we're all about around here. Yeah. I think that is one of the most, uh, you know, constructive way of, of uh, developing your own, uh, your own way, your own take on psychoanalysis mm -hmm. to speak to, to strangers, basically, <laughs> people who you do not know, people who, who, may have different experiences, different, you know, countries, different institutions, etc. To speak to people without knowing where it will take you. I think it's 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 absolutely essential, in particular when it comes to heterodox uh, psychoanalysis. It's not just repeating the same concepts, not speaking as as you have said, Michael, several times, just repeating the 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 the, the concepts of signifier, signifier this, signifier that, you know, not speaking with with people who who you know will say the same thing as as you are supposed to say. And when there is uh, some kind of uh, implicit demand of saying, uh, doing it right, saying it right, you know, you are, mm -hmm. these questions are in a sense, you know, right from the outset sub subtracted from, from this form of encounter, where there is a lot more space for, for aleatory, you know, events. Things just, just happen in a way which uh, tend to be uh, less common when the situation is too, uh, too uh, structured, you know, when there is a, a point of reference, some kind of guarantee uh, of what's right and wrong, that's nice when, when talking to to, to strangers. Uh, I think I think there's a fear of speaking sometimes among analysts. We were talking a little bit about psychoanalytic scenes, New York conferences, and these things, and I find so many much that new people in the field don't want to speak, or then people who are really well known are the only people who speak. Like you, you know, some people do a panel. And then the person who speaks is the person who's written like seven books. And then maybe somebody who's new doesn't get to ask an interesting question, which might be very different. Nobody even wants to say, I don't know, which is quite strange. Yeah. If you're talking about a subject, the subject doesn't know. And if it's the neurotic subject, there's a powerful desire not to know. But, but psychoanalysts seem to want to abstain from these things sometimes in the social bond. You know, myself included at times. I don't want to paint myself as a, in a different corner here. Totally. I have to ask, though, since you said you came from different places, different institutes where you trained, what are these places? No, Pablo, please go ahead. Well, I come from, uh, from Sweden. Sweden isn't necessarily the, the mecca of psychoanalysis. No. 
this is, this, there, it exists here, but there aren't any, any big institutional, great, you know, tradition. We have the, in Stockholm, we have uh, the, the Swedish uh, uh, section of the IPA, in um, which is quite plainly on Bionia and Winnicott, you know, and in Gothenburg, you have more of an emphasis on, on, on Lacan, but there aren't any, you know, real traditions concerning different kinds of schools, except for the IPA, I would say. So, so in fact, unfortunately and uh, thankfully, I haven't had the experience of passing through this, this you know, general um, process of, of, of being in a school, doing everything within the framework of, of, of a school. Um, I've been in Paris also for two years and visited different kinds of schools and events, etc. But I never wanted to participate uh, actively anywhere. Uh, so, uh, so in a sense, I, I, um, I live in some kind of in between. You're so lucky. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. Smart. It, 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 you know, it, 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 I don't know if it's smart or not. It's uh, it was just how it that, turned out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't have too many options, you know. And uh, yeah, that's that's my experience. Uh, this also implies, of course, that when it comes to 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 developing your own take on psychoanalysis, I am liberated, you know, from from transference, basically. Uh, to a large extent, and uh, and transference, of course, something which is absolutely fundamental of becoming a psychoanalyst. You know, who do you, who who do you, who is the su subject supposed to know? It's the Lacan who wrote this book, so who spoke mm -hmm. and is it Freud? You know, but but a specific person, you know, who who functions as some kind of bearer of the knowledge of psychoanalysis. I I haven't necessarily had these persons involved in my life to to a, to a big to a to a to a big extent. So mm -hmm. so. This lack of of transference also uh, has become. I I perceive it as as uh, as a blessing in a sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'd say yeah. so, yeah. but thank goodness for Per Magnus Jonsson for for going to Paris and studying and bringing Lacan to Gothenburg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Per Magnus is a hugely important figure in uh, for psychoanalysis in in Sweden and Gothenburg in particular, uh, and. Particularly, I think that that his influence is absolutely dependent on on him being in uh, in in Paris for many many years. Per Magnus Johansson, Swedish psychoanalyst, um, yeah, and he uh, I would consider him a friend of mine. A very very constructive um, uh, talks, and when I was in Paris, we always took the same stroll for one hour uh, by the Seine, you know, in the seventh and sixth arrondissement. Uh, but but it is not transferential relation it is it's conditioned by some kind of mutual recognition uh, which is conditioned also by some kind of uh, recognition of the difference in, in generations but it is in this classical uh, transferential relationship when when you subject yourself in a sense to to that which you suppose that he knows uh, it's something different and um, and yeah speaking about these forms of encounters you know with with strangers at a certain distance i would mm -hmm. i would uh, understand it in terms of that and uh, that is something which I which I appreciate with him, he uh, uh, and other persons as well. People do not always, I mean, figures of authority in the psychoanalytic field, they do not always uh, subject the subject <laughs> uh, to the transferential relationship, but they can, you know, give this kind of of liberty and freedom for you to do your own thing. And uh, this, I think, creates uh, excellent conditions for for a form of uh, dialogue, which uh, which is absolutely open and uh, leaves the, the door open for confusion also. You know, when I first moved to Sweden, I had imagined leaving New York and going to Stockholm. I would set up something similar, like have an office and like get events going or things like that. But uh, I found that it was not. It's not. It's not. There's not as much momentum it's not as easy to get momentum going in sweden mm -hmm. as it is in new york it was like everyone was just like Meh, eh. like really mm -hmm. people were really like in their thing and like they have no interest in moving out of that thing they were just like nope mm -hmm. i'm comfortable here that's fine yeah. nothing i think new, that's really a shame <laughs> to, to be to be stuck in one thing i mean for myself i had a, a counter experience to pablo i've always been since I began my clinical studies and um, continuing with my clinical work oriented to uh, a school of Lacan, usually an international school for, for a long time for me, that was uh, one certain Lacanian school. Although these days I find my work uh, more oriented by people like the Lacanian compass, but I also have uh, been taking seminars with the Freud Lacan Institute. So 
for me, working with people at great distance has never been an issue. It's always been sort of uh, something I took for granted rather than just be you know, tied to one scene of, of New York and Sweden, although we have a surprisingly thriving psychoanalytic community in Colorado. Uh, I don't know why Colorado. People, patients, just analysis off the street, really like to be in analysis. I don't know if they like it all the time, but they they certainly go. So um, it's it, quite remarkable to be like at a, a slight remove from never having been part of like, I guess, a, a mainstream scene, but still uh, fundamentally Lacanian. This is this is one of the reasons I think I um, struck up this relationship with with Pablo is I read his work. Well, at first I was intrigued by the work. I was like, "What in the hell is this? It's 130 pages. How can this this guy go past Lacan? He's a his name is Pablo. He lives in Sweden. I gotta I gotta hear more. <laughs> What's going uh, on here? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I've never heard of this guy, but but his 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 ideas are very interesting. And you know, in in spite of your own counter experience of this way, Pablo, I consider your work to be. Uh, fundamentally psychoanalytic and something that I think more people should be familiar with, uh, particularly in, in its view of the clinic, which offers, I think, something very different than either these IKEA, that's a Swedish thing, right? IKEA how-to clinical guides or, uh, you know, some very uh, austere theoretical book. It's a, it's a clinical book to me very much. Now, that's my reading of your work. You're welcome to say if you have a different opinion of your work. But I, but I found it to be refreshing and the kind of social bond that can be established at that remove from the mainstream to be very important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I agree with you totally. We spoke about this earlier. I was very, very happy about uh, how you read the book. It is indeed a book mm -hmm. on uh, psychoanalytic practice more than everything else. I, I conceive mm -hmm. psychoanalysis as a practice, not a theory. Although mm -hmm. there's a lot of theory in it, you have also read it, Vanessa. But, but uh, one of the aims, of course, in, in the reading experience of this book is... is Con confusion in a sense situating you know the the reader in a state of i do not know what is this mm -hmm. how should i take this is this what you know mm -hmm. uh, which i perceive of as being fundamental for for the psychoanalyst and such you know and reflects mm -hmm. in a sense also the the psychoanalytic situation not only for the analysis and you know where confusion obviously is a necessary step mm -hmm. you know in, in 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 doing your analysis but also for the psychoanalyst you know, also for the psychoanalysts, certainly to a certain degree in every psychoanalysis, there are always these very, very constructive and important uh, moments mm -hmm. of surprise. You know, what, what is this, you know, these uh, these moments are, are essential. If, if, if you want to, you know, be a bit simplistic, you could see uh, psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. psychoanalysis as a series of uh, surprises, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, also finding your own way of situating yourself in relation to psychoanalysis requires a certain degree of confusion. Mm -hmm. And this chapter, you know, metaphorically at least, uh, I speak of in terms of internal exile, of exile, is mm -hmm. particularly of, of finding yourself in a state of exile in relation also to psychoanalysis. And this, I believe, to be absolutely crucial. Um, which is crucial yes. is, is how, how, how should I put it? Um, you have to, hopefully, you know, when you go through psychoanalysis, um, things having to do with a transracial relationship, you you you, you know you you pass through that. After a while, you mm -hmm. stop situating the analyst in the position that the subject is supposed to know. Mm -hmm. You go through the confusion, etc. This also has to be the case, obviously, for the psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. the psychoanalyst, when they go to analysis, obviously. But also when it comes to psychoanalysis itself, Absolutely. you know, you, you tend to, you tend to, to establish these transformation relationship to psychoanalysts, to, to different blah, blah, blah. And uh, psychoanalysis is a theory, different figures, different theorists, etc. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, it's, it's obvious that you have to liberate yourself from psychoanalysis mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to be free in psychoanalysis. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully, if you've gone through your own psychoanalysis as a psychoanalyst, then you you find some kind of value in it. You have some kind of faith that it may work, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so so hopefully the experience of going through psychoanalysis as a psychoanalyst or you know psychoanalyst in process doesn't lead to reject it wholly, <laughs> but mm -hmm. but to uh, to uh, to liberate yourself from the question of what it means to be a psychoanalyst. You know, mm -hmm. to liberate yourself from that question in order to become it. You know. 
I think I've seen uh, that that can be quite surprising for some colleagues who realize they don't want to be a psychoanalyst at all. And so they go do something else or maybe they uh, stick to being a therapist or do something like that or do something completely different. It's it's a good question. I don't have an answer. How do you have um, some surprises in, a, in an institute or a school? Certainly in institutes of the IPA and I'll, you know, I have some dear friends and colleagues there, so I don't want to pick on them too much, but there's a sequence of coursework. And when you're done the coursework, when you've completed your analysis, that means you're an analyst. That's not surprising. It, it just means if you stick with it, then you get authorized at the guarantee of the other. But how would you introduce a surprise in, into an institute like that? I know we have both worked with the IPA in different ways, uh, different constituent organizations. Where do you put a surprise in there? Do they? Who wants to be surprised? Is a good question. I don't think institutes want surprise. Mm. <laughs> I felt totally dead inside when I was in the institute. Mm. That's what the effect mm. it had on me. It was just like, mm. yeah, I just felt like completely dead. And then every like time we'd have a conference or a lecture to go to, I just feel like everything was so dead. Everything was so mm. dead and dry. And that's why, like Pablo said, I think before we were recording, when we started Das Umbehagen, at some point we realized it's me, Jameson Webster, and this guy, Mark, Michael Garfinkel, were all at the same institute, New York Psychoanalytic Institute, mm. uh, which is like the Mecca in New York. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, we're all the, the institutes split off from there. But um mm. Yeah, it was, we were just there and we were like, like, we know all these like great analysts, you know, we have the internet nowadays. <laughs> we could just like email them and when we'd hear like yeah. someone like Danny Nobis or Darian Leader, or somebody was coming to New York to give a talk at a university or something. We would just email them and be like, hey, we're mm -hmm. like this group of like, you know, psychoanalyst information uh, that mm -hmm. want to like work outside institutes and like bring more like life to psychoanalysis. Like, will mm -hmm. you come talk to our group? and everybody did you know and even our very first talk was with Otto Kernberg which is like kind of amazing now in that like is, retrospect that's a surprise yeah. <laughs> like he was just like sure I'll come you know and like nobody charged us for anything or anything they mm -hmm. just like were happy to talk to some analyst information that were like yeah trying to have a life inside of this kind of structure I've, I've actually been really surprised and I've not worked a, a great deal in New York. It's a little too cold for me. I mean, even though I live in Colorado, but I've, I've been working with these people in uh, in Kansas in the greater Kansas Topeka Psychoanalytic Institute. And I'm so surprised that they're happy to have a Lacanian come in, give some talks and, and talk with them, comment on cases. Uh, I, I don't know how many of them knew what a Lacanian was beyond I, I, they knew it was related to this French guy and his, his waiting room and his short sessions. But that, that was very surprising to me, how open people can be to this if you just, uh, I think, approach in this in the spirit of wanting to work together. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I think I think the thing I got most out of being the Institute was that I understand understood Lacan better in his, like, what he was running away from, <laughs> from his ego psychologist analysts. Because yeah. I had an ego psychologist analyst and I was just oh like, this God. is not analysis. Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hmm. Like he was giving advice and these very long interpretations. And I was like, he's like talking half my session, you know, <laughs> telling me like when I would get upset, like he was like comforting me and telling me how great I was. Oh. And I was like, <laughs> like, this is not, this is not. Thankfully, I had had an an analysis during graduate school in, in Miami um, mm. that was like I was with a candidate. And so it was like four times a week for like ten dollars a session or something. Yeah um mm -hmm. yeah because you know it was graduate school I was broke um and so luckily he, that analysis was really good and I think it was so good because I actually have sent people to him since then and they were not so pleased <laughs> but I mm. think it was really good because he was a candidate and he was probably not talking like he b barely <laughs> talked at all and like when he did say something it was usually something like like really good where I was like oh aha that like really like oh. you know was a good thing to say at that moment but it was so rare it's so like I don't even know if he mm -hmm. said anything every session you know and and mm -hmm. he just like kind of let me do my own work and so when I got to this ego psychologist analyst who's like a training analyst at this fancy institute oh, and, blah, 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 and everybody loved him and whatever whatever and you know and he was just like talking the whole time I was like this is not psychoanalysis and then I felt like like this is what Lacan was running away from and that was basically how I got out of there too was we started Umbahagen but also 
uh, Jameson Webster brought David Lichtenstein to come to our institute mm -hmm. to like give a little mini course on on Lacan that you could take as kind of like an elective, you know, thing. Nice. And once I started reading Lacan, I was like, yeah, what am I doing here? You know, I'm like, I can't can't read Otto Fenichol anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting you mentioned the price because um, most of my work is in a pro bono clinic for women who have experienced pregnancy pregnancy loss, child loss, these things, and I do a lot of um, low fee analysis in the community as well. Like I really try to expand a, a pro bono and low fee clinic. And I think that's certainly against the the psychoanalytic heterodoxy. Like I'm guessing you paid this great ego psychologist more than $10 a session. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably considerably more. And I'm, it's, it's such a funny thing. Psychoanalysts are so funny about money where it's like uh, somehow an analysis is less if it's low fee, but it sounds like you had this really good experience with it was this guy in Florida I, I don't know if he's a guy I assume he's a guy in Florida it was <laughs> yeah sure but there you know there's so many people who would say well that's a that's a candidate's analyst and that's you know a, a training person we don't that's not the real stuff of uh this ego psychologist who talks too much yeah no he was so much better and I'm so glad I had that experience or else I would have maybe thought that that was what analysis was you know <laughs> and maybe mm -hmm. it would have stayed there to my own detriment mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's another good point. Like I was able to do that because I had, I worked at a hospital at the time and I actually had government insurance. And because he was a psychiatrist, nice. the, the ego psychologist, he actually sure. took my insurance through the government. And so the insurance actually paid four times a week and I just had a copay, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. But like, how do people do it otherwise? You know what I mean? Like how, I was very lucky to have that situation. But like, yeah, how do people afford like that kind of expensive analysis during training and they have to pay for supervision and all of this stuff? It's really like, yeah, it makes it very much for the elite, you know? I mean, I've, I've always had my own analysis. I've always controlled my cases and been involved in didactics, but I've, I've always been outside of a formalized institute in that way. So it was not a cost in that way for me. But also I see most of the people I see two, three, four times a week. It's just for a fee probably closer to what you were paying in Florida, which is, to me, still a very Lacanian analysis. Like, I practice the short session. I There's no reason people can't do it that way. It's just they haven't thought to. Like, with you and Das Uberhagen and, and your colleagues, like, why hadn't somebody done that before? Because they never thought of it. Then it was thought of. Then it was spoken. Then it was done. Yeah, now we have more opportunity th than ever to connect because we, we are, we're all remote and we can connect this way. So to me, there's sure. like this is like a really great opportunity for psychoanalysis, especially like it's not as super regulated as like, say, psychology in the U.S. You know, you sure. can work across like country borders. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's like a, it's like a great time for psychoanalysis in that way where I think it could be really grow. And I think it is really growing. And we can have institutes, like you said, the Lacanian Compass, there's Lacan Salon in, in mm -hmm. Vancouver always doing events and All the Freud people. Lacan Institute out of Dublin. There's out of Australia. There's like so many different different places that you can go to study groups and lectures and things without having to be in the same place. Or even find an analyst if you don't want to work with somebody in your area if you're like living you know god forbid oklahoma or something sorry if there's any viewers in oklahoma but <laughs> maybe there's no analyst in oklahoma you want to work with. maybe there's no analyst at all i have no idea well you could find somebody and i'm sure they'd be willing to work with you with some you know some contingency mm -hmm. yeah I know um i was thinking about this because because as you say uh michael you know it's I came to think uh, of the idea and then I did it. <laughs> Basically, you know, it's some sometimes we tend to complicate things for ourselves. You know, things are sometimes quite easy, quite simple. When it comes to action, obviously life's difficult, you know, there's a lot of obstacles, you cannot do whatever you want, you know, this this kind of dream of the, the free, you know, I don't believe in that. But so as, as long as you do not relate to that which is right, things are quite simple, you know, just just to do them. But it requires, once again, some kind of, of, of liberty from, from uh, orthodoxy. And I was thinking about this, uh, this question uh, about surprise uh, in the institution once more. Um, 
where does the surprise come from? First of all, from your own psychoanalysis, you know, and there we can also understand that we do not want the surprise in a psychoanalytic institution for the simple fact that surprise by definition, <laughs> at least the psychoanalytic surprise, you know, the lapse, uh, for example, uh, proves that you're wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, and then this is the thing also in, in, uh, in uh, becoming a psychoanalyst and working uh, psychoanalytically uh, more heterodox, you know, it, it almost requires that you're doing things wrong. Not as a mm. as an act of transgression, you know. It's uh, in a sense, it's only in the in the eyes of the the, the law that a heretic, you know, becomes a transgressor. Right. But uh, but do it the doing it, but in quotation marks, relatively independent of what's right and wrong, which you know just doing it and. Uh, <laughs> As a consequence of that, given that you're doing it in a relatively genuine way, you know, uh, doing it wrong in relation to <laughs> different kinds of, if you situate yourself in relation to many different points of view, you're bound to do it wrong. You know, you will do it wrong, and that can bother you to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, I can be uh, absolutely uh, horrified uh, about not uh, uh, interpreting the transference, for example, if I would be a client. Mm -hmm. I would be absolutely mm. horrified if I speak at all, if I would be some kind of uh, a psychoanalyst who, who thinks that the uh, interpretation is violence, for example. Mm. Whatever I do, I do it wrong if I have uh, many points of, of, of reference, uh, which I recognize. And uh, and once again, to, to liberate yourself from, from this is, is important. But but my question to you guys also is, is you know, this experience of the surprise as an act, as a, as a happening of... of, of of being incorrect, of proving yourself, you know, wrong. To what degree is it compatible, you know, with an institution as such? In particular, in the case of psychoanalysis, where no one has, as far as I know, no psychoanalyst has direct access to the unconscious, you know, <laughs> and and psychoanalysts at the same time, since we're not, you know, surgeons, for example, we are also bound to fail, you know. And it's it's inevitable to fail as a psychoanalyst many times. I wouldn't say it's the rule or the, it's nothing like that. It's just it's inevitable you will fail. Um, and uh, this uh, necessity of confronting failure on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, not knowing exactly what the unconscious is, which is the, the the fundamental concept around which our practice revolves. You know, to to what degree. Can the experiences having to do with this, you know, be lifted into a psychoanalytic institution in order to produce, you know, the the, the preconditions for the surprise and the confusion? You know, this is a question which which I wouldn't say that it bothers me or preoccupies me, but when I think about a psychoanalytic institution which I would like to be a part of, it would certainly be like this. It's it's interesting to think about that practicing in the institute because this is why they expelled Lacan for for introducing surprise for using the cut. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's that uh, I think uh, invalid criticism like, well, he just wanted more money. He had money. Well, he just wanted more patience. He had patience. No, but I mean the the short session can be extraordinarily surprising for for people. It's not like um, it it introduces something of the unconscious. It introduces that access of the unconscious to the analysis and not with that, you know, wonderful ego psychologist. He spoke about Vanessa who was like, well, oh, this is how you're really feeling. And I, I don't know, I'm probably like your father or something. I'm, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, but for them to say it and hear it, and then maybe for the candidate to say it and hear it, if, if, you know, it is such a place of candidacy or the analyst in formation. But then it's it's a better question for me, and I, I this is another question I don't have an answer for, how to introduce a cut within the institution beyond the analyses one is conducting with people in that institution. That's rather than just say a split, which might not do anything. Because I, maybe some splits are good. Maybe some splits don't do anything. And it's just uh, the, the same thing will get repeated in a different place. It's it's an open question for me, this idea of, of the institution and its splits. I'm kind of, I'm generally like, I don't want to tell other people what to do in general and just everyone can find their own way. 
and like if they want to be in an institute or whatever that's fine but at this point I'm kind of like an institute abolitionist <laughs> where I really feel like institutes are like antithetical to psychoanalysis except mm. for I really like what the Freud Lacan Institute is doing yeah. but they're not mm -hmm. also not set up I mean they're also new but I also right. just love all those people mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel like they could do a training. Like, I don't think that training is impossible, but I feel mm -hmm. like at least my experience in New York, it's like in order to tell people that they have to go through this training and like, I mean, they even made a sign in like to class, you know, and this is an institute that you have to Ooh. be a doctor already. So it was only yeah. PhDs, PsyDs and MDs, you know, so we're all like went through either graduate school or medical school already. And then we're, we're like working at the hospital all day, seeing our own patients in the evening, going to our own analysis and then going to class at this place on the Upper East Side from like 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. You know, and then like when I asked them I was like why do we have to sign in for class I was like well how else do we know that you're really committed it's like well we're here Ooh, boy. <laughs> like, uh... we can just work as doctors in hospitals and not be doing this right now yeah. <laughs> it's just well, so I mean, absurd I mean by that time almost all of you would have been like north of 30 or close to it you're yeah exactly class, it was like, like 35 40 one of my friends yeah. like his wife was having a baby and like and if we miss more than three classes they didn't let that class count like for that Ugh. semester and one of, his, uh -huh. one of his, his wife was having a baby and they had like oh they thought the baby was coming and it didn't so he missed the class and then the baby actually came so he missed the class and so he missed like three classes and they made him repeat the class it's just like that's what quite that's quite absurd it's so absurd it's, <laughs> quite, it, 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 it's an it's, a, it's an interesting signifier an institute because it implies a kind of a hierarchy who's the hierarchy for who does it serve like um this I'm, I'm interested in this new york psychoanalytic process so this training analyst you were assigned him or did you pick him? Oh, you're going to love this. I love that you want me to talk I'm, about this because I could talk I'm about this forever. <laughs> I'm very interested. I'm so disgruntled. Um, <laughs> but um, I interviewed with him to, as mm -hmm. the candidate to go into the Institute and he requested to be my analyst. Oh, that's that's in, that's interesting. It's gross. <laughs> he doesn't listen to this, does he? I don't think so. <laughs> okay that's that's such an inversion of the demand though that's so s strange to me i mean yeah make an offer open the door but don't say get in here uh, that's really that's really odd but uh, yeah uh, and then there's no it, way to get out of it because then like if you you can't end your analysis because you have to be like in this analysis with one of their training analysts in order to graduate right and then if i would complain about the analysis or, or like yell at him or something um uh, he'd be like well you can just switch analysts and it's like to what to another one that's just like you you know what i Jesus. mean like you're all the same here you're all like this but I mean, that you, you, it's it's such a strange thing. One should have the freedom to choose their own analyst, to work with who they want rather than, I mean, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, but yeah, of course, rather than somebody who's assigned to you or demands you be assigned to them. That's very, uh, yeah, that's very antithetical, I think, to a psychoanalytic orientation. I mean, people yeah. chose to be an analyst with people other than Freud. Sometimes yeah. I did ask Freud and he was like, nah, I take a walk, go see this guy, but uh, yeah, that it's such a question of demand to me. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because in in this situation, which is absolutely uh, absurd, I think uh, it's some kind of explicit demand, but it's always implicitly there in every institution. Perhaps you have the freedom to choose, but basically you're choosing something which is supposed to be general. You know, there is something in particular subjects or particular analyst which is supposed to be the same, uh, mm -hmm. which is absolutely fundamental for the logic of the institution. Of course, but but I was thinking about abolishing everything, <laughs> abolishing it. just all of it. Just That's the institutes. <laughs> just, yeah. How about not the <laughs> online institutes? <laughs> what would, uh, or just keep the word Lacan Institute because I love them. <laughs> what would the alternative be even is there to institutes? Mm. Because because I I certainly uh, believe in in the in the value of of having venues where you can the dialogue basically. And and I I ask myself what kind of venues there can there can uh, as it be exist which aren't you know uh, subjected to the institutional logic where things tend to be determined by this demand explicit or implicit I I, I wonder what the what the alternatives could be 
Yeah, because I feel like what you did is ideal because like, okay, you luckily had Per Magnus Ewensen in Gothenburg. You could study with him and get into Lacan. And then you could go over to Paris for a couple of years and go to talks and lectures. And and I don't know how you did your analysis, but whatever. You can like choose your analyst, choose your supervisor, talk to colleagues, go to lectures that interest you. I feel like at some point it's the same thing where you have they have to you have to understand that you're going to at some point your desire you're you're going to want to continue to learn about psychoanalysis on your own you know and so like maybe the institute can like get people started with like these are some fundamental texts but it should be within mind that like you know you should be going to lectures and reading people that you find of interest you know and, and letting mm -hmm. yourself like develop yourself in that way where in, instead of being like our that program I went to was like four years you have to take these mm -hmm. classes they weren't even organized so that like one week there was like the same paper assigned from two different teachers and like by by my third year my first year there was six of us and then like two of the other women got pregnant and so they went part-time and someone else went part-time so the second year there was like three of us in my class and then by the third year there was only me and this one other guy and like Jeez. and like we had heard everything each other had to say and he was like super into the institutional structure and like you know please master I'm your whatever and like mm. he was a psychiatrist he was also had a PhD in neuropsychology so it's oh, just God. like a masochist. And you said to spend <laughs> we got a PhD days in neuropsychology, then went to become a psychiatrist, and then went to analytic training. He just like wanted to be subjected forever. But um, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we we just like didn't agree on anything. It was like, how much am I gonna learn talking to this guy? And like I remember like one class, this this uh, teacher was like you know, why aren't you saying much? It's like, well, because we already talked about this paper on Monday, you know, <laughs> like you guys mm -hmm. aren't organized in what you're doing. And then, and then the, my very last one, I had like a few points of like, I can't take this anymore. And one was that we had a teacher who was teaching, supposedly teaching Freud, we had like Freud classes, which I liked, you know, we're going through Freud kind of chronologically, all the major works. And, and he, he was teaching beyond the pleasure principle, but he was like an evolutionary biologist, psychiatrist teaching beyond the pleasure principle. So and, and, and it was the last class of the whole semester. And we didn't have time to like get to everything he wanted to get to. So he literally told us like, should we read beyond the pleasure principle and go over it in one, one class, by the way, in an hour and a half, or should we read this paper by me that, that I wrote oh, in this journal? And I was like, I think we should read the Freud, you know? <laughs> and of course the other guy was like, oh no teacher, let's read your paper. And so he's like, okay, we'll go over both. <laughs> I can't believe you did this for minutes. four years. That's crazy. You did this for four years. That's crazy. I did it for three years. I, I did not make oh, it to the fourth years. year. I, 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 I snapped. I was like, I can't. And, and, but anyway, in that class, when he was te teaching beyond the pleasure principle, he then, he then, uh, got to the death drive and he was like this is what Freud he basically told us that Freud was like demented <laughs> like had lost his mind and so like Ugh. this part doesn't make sense and you don't have to read Freud after this <laughs> I was like why are you teaching Freud if this is what you think you know and then so, the other guy was well, like oh but that's it's evolution it doesn't make sense that anything would have evolved to have a death drive and I was like why are you psychoanalysts <laughs> Well, that's that's such a good question because I assume this was for the the Yelp qualification, right, or something like this, like to be a, a registered analyst. Yeah, they or have that now. That wasn't happening when I was in training. That wasn't but yeah, I mean, it's a newer it, it, thing. The idea of the the legal or political guarantee of of a psychoanalyst is so strange to me, or of oh. having to work with with some people. Like maybe it's very American of me, but I very much believe in it. That freedom of movement, that literal free association. To work with people you choose to work with without uh you know having to do this for whatever i mean by licensure i'm a counselor but that's not a hard thing to be i can just call myself an analyst because of various because you are <laughs> <laughs> it's you know i don't uh there's no board of psychoanalysis in colorado hopefully there never will be because i would be having to move but you know, yeah because yeah, that is I'd messing move. people up now having the yeah. license and like now you have to be licensed to practice and how's that going to work? It's like well, I've I've heard colleagues in those kind of states or institutes and they say, well, I I can't really do analysis because I don't have the legal qualification. I'm like, what does well, that maybe mean? I should talk, well, maybe I should talk to my lawyer before I say this. But who's going to know when you 
close the door, like whether you're using the, the difference couch or between something. doing announcements or you're just going to do therapy instead, you know? Sure. They, the insurance like you, companies don't, don't pay for psychoanalysis anyway, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What I mean, what's what's that mean? You can't say the word unconscious to somebody. You, If they bring you a dream, you have to be like, well, listen, I got six months left in my training. Write that one down and bring it back later. Yeah. It's, it's, so but I was thinking. I was thinking. Like it. It sounds like all three of us are are in in favor of some kind of enduring, some kind of in betweenness in the in the field of psychoanalysis. And uh, I wonder if it could be some kind of band of uh, of uh, psychoanalytic mm -hmm. vagabonds <laughs> or not. But but um, the question, of course, becomes how how can you how can you be a psychoanalyst or how can you you say that you are a psychoanalyst if you choose the route of the of the vagabond. And uh, hopefully, you choosing this path enables you to be less preoccupied by it, you know. Mm -hmm. And you can also perhaps choose uh, to call yourself a psychoanalyst. Uh, many persons see it as some kind of honorary title or some kind of legal thing. I, I don't think you should perceive it as that. It, it's it's a, it's a job basically. We shouldn't, we shouldn't you know make things bigger than they are. We're doing basically speaking to patients, listening to them, you know, in in uh, in the spirit, whatever that means of, of certain psychoanalysts and blah blah blah. But but hopefully choosing this vagabond path uh, enables you to be less preoccupied by this. And perhaps calling yourself this uh, not because of some kind of guarantee, but because it's reasonable to do it. Because why not? Because what should I uh, what else should I call myself, you know? Sure. And I also think in Amer it's a very American preoccupation because people in Europe don't seem to be as preoccupied with this. But America is mm -hmm. so preoccupied with like, what are the rules? What is the law? You know, because of all the different states and all the different rules and everything. Well, if people ask me what I do, I say I'm a psychoanalyst because, yeah, I have a counseling licensure, but it's not an accurate description of what I do. I don't do anything in the way of counseling anybody. <laughs> I don't really tell people what to do. I don't have a lot of good advice for them, uh, so I say I'm a psychoanalyst, and uh, it's, it doesn't. People get intrigued by this, though. I think, I think the patients are more interested in analysis sometimes than the the analyst information. The people doing the training who are preoccupied with these questions of, you know, uh, where where do I fit in in the institute? What does this mean for me? It, it's it's good to orient yourself in these things if you want them, if you want them. But beyond that, maybe not. And this is the thing. I, I, I've had some encounters with, with uh, you know, important figures in psychoanalysis who aren't that preoccupied about the question of being an important figure in psychoanalysis. For example, someone who is a part of a psychoanalytic institute may be, you know, the guardian of the law of, of, of the institute and, the, the, you know, et cetera. But they can also... Uh, not care so much you know, uh, about the institute. They are granted that liberty, I, I suppose, by coming to that level. But, but, but it's a huge difference if you are within the, the, the framework of, of an institute to go into psychoanalysis with someone who, who perceives uh, the aim of the an analysis, amongst other things, is to, to, to become an analyst of the school, for example, to get mm. some, kind of, you know, some kind of certificate or something like that be recognized and accepted by the Institute as a psychoanalyst. And on the other hand, have an analyst who says to you or so makes you understand or you know directs the treatment in, in, in some form of uh, direction, which makes you understand and feel that the question, uh, I want to become an analysis, uh, an analyst is the wrong question. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's absolutely the wrong question uh, when you enter into analysis. I, I suppose yeah. I understand do it but you have to liberate yourself from the question yeah, yeah i think I, mean, I think that when i say that we i want to have be i'm kind of an uh, abolitionist of institutes at this point this is exactly why because i feel like if you go into analysis with this idea that you are doing it for this reason you know to graduate this program to be this thing and buying into this whole like social order hierarchical mm -hmm. order I don't feel like these are real analyses. Well, like I, when I did my first analysis, I didn't have to do that. I, when I went to graduate school, I assumed because I liked Freud and Jung and stuff that like I was going to go there and then you had to go through therapy to become a psychologist. It was, I was in a clinical psychology program, but it was not analytic at all. But they had like a, a, a 
group of analysts that and therapists that would do reduced fee you know sessions for yeah. students or whatever like at the main office and you could look through that and pick one or whatever so that's what I did but it was because of my desire I drove myself to do that and I drove my school was an hour away and I drove down to Miami an hour every day to go mm. there and then an hour back you know and I did that did mm. that work but I feel like when you have this kind of goal in mind at the outset I, and I feel like maybe that's why there's so many bad analysts <laughs> like well, are these are these people really analyzed because they're st- they're st- they they haven't gotten to that place where they realize I'm not the subject that knows you know <laughs> like you know other people it's, it's might really be in question. that place as master but I'm I'm not a master I don't know any more than, than anybody else you know exactly and this is the point also which Lacan makes in the first seminars uh he speaks of uh, concerning ego psychology that the aim of analysis is to identify with the ego of the of the analyst you know which is yeah exactly but, but that we is were the taught that by the way end of the really yeah <laughs> well that's good but uh, the end of analysis <laughs> you know in this sense is alienation you know it, the mm-hmm. end of, of analysis is not you know some kind of uh, relative liberty from alienation but alienation is uh, the point where you want to to to, to come mm-hmm. in as well and the, the the problem obviously is that like in an institution function like this, you know, if if you want to become an analyst, you know, uh, in many uh, relatively orthodox psycholytic institution, what you have to do basically is identify with the analyst. What you basically mm-hmm. do is alienate yourself into you know this kind of uh, conception of what an analysis is, of how we should think, etc. And uh, this is. I agree with you totally. This this uh, creates a certain distance, you know, from that which is absolutely essential for a psychoanalyst, which is the opposite of alienation. I do not know what it is. Perhaps you could speak of it as surprise. Perhaps you could speak of it as mm. full speech. Perhaps I don't know confusion certainly, but um, but to gain 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 access to to this, you know, is absolutely essential for me. Crucial to become a good analyst. You know, to become a good analyst. Uh, you know, the, patient, it, the patient will certainly uh, feel the difference, you know, if the, if the analyst is, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say authentic in the Heideggerian way, you know, because it's a it's a weird concept. But let's speak like in in, in everyday terms, genuine, <laughs> you know, genuine. If the analyst, for example, is genuinely funny, <laughs> you know, for example, mm-hmm. if they make an interpretation in the form of the wit, in accordance with Lacan's theory of the wit, it can be an extremely boring wit. And it can be a wit which is supposed to be boring, but it's still even more, you know, it's just boring, it's just bad. It's a wit that doesn't function, you know. But you can be genuinely extremely funny and serious at the same time and make an excellent mm-hmm. interpretation, which is genuine. And it, it is just because of the genuineness of it that it is received yeah. as such, you know. That can also be an excellent punctuation, a joke. It's a, a perfect way to scan a session. Yeah. It, I, it's it's coming back around to me, this idea of of surprise in the analytic institute. And one thing I've been reading a lot of late, always, but lately are, are some testimonies of the past. And one I recall reading last night, the author's name escapes me. Uh, this is a, a person in France, I believe, though. Uh, they were surprised they were going to do the past. They had left their analysis like a year ago uh, or a year before they decided to do so and something happened. They heard some phrase, they saw something, and were like, oh, of course, okay. Uh, that's that's something one produces on their own, though. Yes, as a result of the, uh, the, the analysis, the end of the analysis, or some way of concluding, but, you know, in many of these, these testimonies I read that seem to produce an analyst or, or, or judges having done so, there is surprise. There's a lot of surprise in the end, uh, but that's not going to happen, and you know, certain kind of institutional analysis where somebody really does just want to identify with the analyst or an analyst or the idea of being the analyst. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, this is what a, a Lacanian does. This is what a Freudian does. This is what a Kleinian does. This is what I do because I'm in this institute. No, uh, but to find institute or not, to find your own way in these things is, is quite interesting. Yeah. That's that's a surprise. That's the cut that's introduced perhaps in the past. Absolutely. And I'm going to plug the Freud Lacan Institute one more time while we're here. <laughs> I also like what they're doing because um, I love all of the Dubliners, but I think it's also like done in a way that's thoughtful for people mm-hmm. in their career. It's on Saturdays mm-hmm. once a month for mm-hmm. two years, you know, 
this is doable. <laughs> you know, you could go, you do a morning lecture seminar, you have lunch, and then in the afternoon you do supervision, you know, and then after two years, once a month, you know, you you've done their program. And I feel like that's a really good all the all the people presenting lecturers are incredible. They're like all my favorite Lacanians, you know? And like, yeah, it's doable, it's accessible, it's on the weekend, it's online, so people can do it from anywhere. Um, and I think they've thought about like what what is realistic because people are already in their careers and already in their jobs. It's not too demanding, gives people a good solid base uh, to mm -hmm. get going and then hopefully like sparks their desire and they'll keep studying in, in their analytic career, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I really also like what they're doing over there. I found them to be uh, very, very warm people, very funny people too. Uh, the the lectures are pretty early for me. It's about at three a.m. starting here. Yeah, but, I know. Uh, I saw it's totally dark. I you know. Were. I'm just like, it's like, what time is it? It's like it, two in the morning. It, it was like three. <laughs> I was walking to my office at two thirty. But that's my desire to do so. Yeah. I wanted to do that, and I I would definitely encourage people to check that out also, if they're interested. I will link Eve, to Eve it. Eve is pretty cool. Yeah. And also, oops, I just realized this one minute I have a patient going to call. Um, also, check out Pablo's book, and I'll, I'll link to the episode that Pablo is on talking about it, though. But we'll plug it one more time, too. Speculating on the edge of psychoanalysis rings and voids, which kind of sparked this discussion. Thanks, Vanessa. I kind of am um, quite partial, but I, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys both for being here. I'm glad we got to do this. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. And Papa. you're welcome back anytime. Just email me anytime you want to come back and have more speculative discussion. All right. Thank you. Guys you. Have a lot of fun. Take care Bye. now. Yeah. yeah thank you.